Maggie Chandler slipped quietly from the bedroom where Robert was beginning to stir. He'd be up soon and off to work. Maggie quickly prepared him a hot breakfast and a cold lunch to carry. Robert was rubbing his hands together as he clumped into the dining room. I wonder when they're going to turn on the steam. It's icy in that bedroom. I think the landlord said it wouldn't be until November 1st, Maggie said. November 1st? We'll all have frozen to death by then. He said the coal shortage is worse than ever this year. Robert sat at the table, dug into the hot plate of eggs Maggie set in front of him, and sipped at the coffee. This stuff is worse than ever, he said. Maggie smiled. Robert had been complaining about her coffee for nearly 30 years, but the war had given her ample reason for a poor product. She had told him the news the night before about the civilian prisoner exchange, but Robert had not taken much hope in it. She's not a civilian, he said. Even if she's alive, they're not going to let her come back so easily. Captain Sheffield said the names of the three nurses were on the civilian list. Fine, he had said. Believe what you want. Just don't force your optimism on me. Now Maggie picked at the eggs she'd served herself. Finally, she said quietly, it's not optimism, it's hope. What? Last night, you said I had some kind of false optimism. I don't think that's true. I'm just holding on to hope. False hope, then, if that's what you want to call it, Robert said. He looked away, his face drawn and hard. It's no good. It will only lead to more pain. She's dead. She's got to be dead by now. Why do you have to say that? Because I can't bear all this hoping and wondering. I've got work to do. I can't fill my head with worries. I'm better off knowing she's dead. No, Robert. No. Yes. He stomped from the dining room and noisily put on his coat in the entryway. I'll be home late. I've got meetings all day and drawings to approve. Maggie retrieved her Bible and journal from the shelf by the stove and sat heavily in the chair. Oh, Lord, why does it have to be so hard, so long? She turned to a new page and wrote October 5, 1943, in her flowing script. Yesterday, we received word that Helen may be on a ship heading for a prisoner exchange. Oh, joy, thank you, Lord, for a breath of hope. But Lord, Robert is so right. With new hope comes new worry. What if she's not on the ship? How can any of us survive that? What if the ship is torpedoed or sunk in a storm or the Japanese go back on the deal? Lord, I need your peace. My heart's in turmoil. I don't know how to help my husband. I don't know how to help Lillian. I can't help Lewis or Helen. Help me. Maggie closed the book and put her head on her arms. The egg sat in her stomach. Tears squeezed past her closed eyes. Minutes later, Maggie sat up. She'd heard noises from the bedroom that Lillian shared with Pauline and Susan. It sounded like fighting. She went to the doorway. You two are just so messy. It's like living in a pig pen, Lillian said. What's got into you, Pauline asked, speaking as usual for both twins. Nothing's got into me. But if Helen's coming home, there will be four of us in here. We need to clean this mess. We need to get ready. Still unaware, apparently, of her mother standing in the doorway, Lillian picked up a crumpled dress off the floor and threw it at her sister. We can't let her find us like this. Almost the last thing I told her was that I would keep her room clean. Maggie stepped in. Lillian, calm down. Even if she's on that ship, which I pray she is, she can't possibly get here for weeks. Weeks, Lillian said. Weeks? Yes, of course. What was I thinking? She collapsed onto her bed and laughed thinly. Somehow I woke up this morning and thought she'd be home any day. I couldn't think of anything to do except clean. Maggie watched Lillian pose herself, then said quietly, Don't you have to get ready for work? Lillian started. What time is it? Quarter to eight. 
goodness, Penny will be here in 15 minutes. Maggie went back to the kitchen and fixed Lily in a bowl of her favorite oatmeal. Lily ate it quickly. Thanks, Mom, she said. I'm sorry I'm such a mental case this morning. It's all right. We're all feeling a little anxious right now. Lillian looked up from her bowl and seemed to study her mother's face. Maggie knew the little bit of makeup she'd put on that morning was a teary mess. Mom, are you all right? I'm fine, dear, Maggie replied. I'm sorry you keep finding me like this. Another fight with Dad? No, not, not really. Lily, you have to understand, he loves Helen deeply, so deeply that he won't allow himself to hope. But inside, his worry is destroying him. Well, he shouldn't take it out on you. He doesn't do it on purpose. He doesn't know any other way but to bluster and stay busy. The only way he can help is to work on a ship and win the war. In a broken world full of broken people, we all struggle for peace. That was true during World War II, and it's true today. This year, we're looking at what we really want for Christmas, things like hope and peace and joy and love, and above all, the presence of God, the presence of Jesus in our lives. Many of us came here today with a shortage of peace. Like Maggie Chandler in my story, you may be worried about your children or about your marriage or maybe it's your finances, or your own lack of responsibility, or your temptations that have you unsettled. Maybe it's something medical, your own health of a disaster, or a love for coping with a chronic illness, or a hard-to-diagnose set of symptoms. Maybe it's just busyness. Whatever it is, it's really easy to have your peace shattered for moments, days, weeks, months, even years. In the face of our lack of peace, I'd like this morning to explore the truth that for each of us, peace comes as the fruit of our relationship with God. I'd like to offer you one obvious step and one deceptively simple discipline that can lead to peace. Let me start by briefly reminding us that peace is a Christmas theme. God promised peace through the incarnation of his Son. Isaiah 9, 6, a beloved Christmas verse, is a promise of peace. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. God is committed to the increase peace through the Prince of Peace. That's why this child was born. That's why this son was given. And the Gospel of Luke is focused on the peace given by the Messiah. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, says the Messiah will guide our feet in the paths of peace. Simeon, when he sees the Messiah Jesus, says the Lord can now dismiss him in peace. And when the angel announces to the shepherds the good news of great joy, he speaks of peace on earth to men on whom God's favor rests. No wonder Christmas cards and wrapping paper and Christmas wallpaper for your computer and Christmas emails are all so often emblazoned with this word, peace. It's a Christmas theme. The Bible, of course, talks a lot about peace. The Old Testament word shalom is used 250 times. The New Testament word irene, from which we get the name irene, is used 125 times. Sometimes these are simple references to the absence of war or strife. But most of the time, peace is described in the context of relationship with God. Peace is the fruit of my relationship with God. So peace begins with reconciliation to God. The underlying foundational text for this year's series is Romans 5, verses 1 to 8, and it begins with peace. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Paul says we have peace with God because we're justified, we're made righteous by faith through Jesus himself. The term I'm going to be using today is reconciliation, which is another aspect of that same truth. But the truth is also seen in the words salvation and forgiveness and redemption. What's central to all of these is God dealing with our sin. Isaiah teaches us that our sins have separated us from God. Paul argues in preparation for Romans 5.1 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The central issue of peace with God is that I cannot be at peace with God while my sin stands between us. And I cannot deal with that sin. Nothing I do will move it out of the way. God himself deals with it. God himself makes peace between us. At Christmas, God was taking into his own hands the responsibility for reconciliation. John Wesley got it right and hark the herald angels sing. It's glory to the newborn king because it's peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled, brought together again. One Old Testament, one New Testament passage will illustrate this truth. In the Old Testament, we see it in Isaiah 53, chapter about the suffering servant, verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds... We are healed. Classic verses show that the Messiah, Jesus, would serve as a substitute for sinful people, bearing their sin, taking their punishment. Jesus reconciles us to God and gives us peace. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. The word here is shalom. It's well-being. It's fulfillment. It's a positive quality. It's not just the absence of strife, but it's the reality of provision and contentment. Old Testament peace with God carries with it the idea that God fills my days, fills my moments, fills my life, and that he is all I need. Psalm 73, whom have I in heaven but you, and earth has nothing I desire besides you. That's peace, the fullness of of God. In the New Testament, in Colossians, Paul says of Jesus that God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through his death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Do you hear what there? This is the Christmas story. God reconciles to himself all things. That is, he makes peace with them through the blood of Jesus shed on the cross. Once Paul says, you were enemies of God. You were alienated from God because of your evil behavior, your sin. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through his death. Jesus died the death we deserved so that we might be reconciled to God. We have peace. Peace with God, first of all, through the blood of Jesus shed on the cross. It can't be any simpler than that. And that leads to the one obvious step I spoke of earlier. Peace begins with trusting Christ and being reconciled to God. There is no peace apart from that reconciliation. And the result of reconciliation is now how he presents you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. There is nothing that stands between you and God. Your sin is gone and peace is possible. So peace for us here today begins with reconciliation. It begins when you trust Christ for his salvation and are thus reconciled to God. I read a testimony about a woman named Sophie Dole 
I think that's how you pronounce the name. During college, she had a two-year relationship with a guy. She had two abortions. But she was haunted by what she'd done. Every time she saw a child, she'd burst into tears. Feeling guilty and ashamed, she asked God to, to let her have her punishment, to take her life. And when she didn't die, she decided to take her own life. She decided to drive her car head-on into a truck. But she told one friend about it, and he said, okay, I'll come with you. She said, all right, if you want to die, that's your business. As they accelerated down the highway, her friend said to her, you know, you can ask God for forgiveness. She screamed at him, I deserve to die. He screamed back, yes, you do. But Jesus already died in your place. She pulled the car over. I can't be forgiven. Murder is no small sin, you know. And he said, there's no sin so great that God will not pardon it. Sophie Dahl writes, after a few minutes, my choices became clear. I could accept the forgiveness and peace God offered through Jesus, or I could try to take the punishment on myself. Now that I understood the depth of God's forgiveness, my heart was drawn to him as it never had been before. Peace with God starts with reconciliation. Forgiveness received, his gift of righteousness given. That's what Christmas is all about. But the Bible teaches that peace grows in us in dependence on God. There are a hundred verses that could show this, but I want to start in Romans 8. It says, those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit, Paul writes, is life and peace. Real living come when we focus on what God the Holy Spirit desires. And in the rest of Romans 8, Paul gives us the basis for our confidence in God and thus for our peace. Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God is in control of all that happens to us. Therefore, Romans 8, 35, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ because God's in control. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, Paul says, for I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the basis for peaceful dependence on God. He's in control, and his love for you is unstoppable. So we find this peace through trust. We find this peace in dependence throughout Scripture, Isaiah 26. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever for the Lord, the Lord is the rock eternal. Peace comes from trusting God on a day-to-day -day basis. Trust comes from knowing that God is the rock, the sure foundation. The more focused you are on God, the more stayed your mind is on him, the more you trust him. And the more you trust him, the less power circumstances have to mar your peace. There's a final section that makes this process even more clear. Philippians 4, 6 through 9, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, with prayer and by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, Think about these things. 
what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Paul says, don't be anxious. Anxiety is the opposite of peace. It's also the normal state of countless people. But Paul offers us an alternative in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. This is the practical path to daily peace, the simple discipline that I'm encouraging all of us to embrace today. We take the real stresses of our day-to-day lives, and with a sigh, we hand them over. We trade them with someone who can handle them. And in return, he gives us a peace that passes understanding, a supernatural peace, a gift from a loving Father. This is what we have to do with all the anxieties we talked about earlier. Too much to do causing you stress? Consciously hand that anxiety over to God. Your too much to do is not too much for God. Difficult relationships that cause us too much, so much worry? We have to trust God with those things. In prayer, in daily prayer, financial concerns, they'll eat you up until you put them in his hands. I'm not counseling inactivity here, but confidence that he has it all worked out down to the last penny. Medical concerns. Medical concerns for your loved ones or yourself. God longs to hear your prayer and petition, and as you hand those things over to him, he'll carry you. Uncertain about the future? Your your future is in his hands anyway. Why not leave it there? Our response to anxiety, then, is prayerful dependence on a God who is in control and who loves us unstoppably. We won't always understand his ways, but we can have a supernatural peace. But it's not found just in what we take our minds off of, but it's what we fix them on that brings this peace. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. That's where your daily quiet time, after you give stuff to God, that's where it needs to go. And this is one of the beauties of Christmas. The incarnation of Jesus is true. It's noble. It's righteous. It's pure. It's lovely. It's admirable. It's most excellent and praiseworthy. The Christmas season can be a time of more peace because as we take our eyes off our anxieties, we can put them on the beautiful thing that God did at Christmas. So what we're saying today is really very simple. Peace comes out of a relationship with God. It comes out of that initial reconciliation with God, which he won for us through his incarnate son. And it comes out of dependence on God, which trusts him daily with our worries and anxieties. Weeks later, Maggie stood at the kitchen window looking out into the alley. Where were her children now, she wondered. They had only just heard that the Canadian 1st Infantry was involved in the landings in Italy. What was really happening to Lewis, to Helen? Were they safe, hurt, dead? Her thoughts turned to the increasing distance in her marriage. Since the news of Helen's possible return, Robert had worked even longer hours and avoided all conversation about, well, everything. And Lillian, she kept finding ways to get ready. Once it was a frenzy about getting food in the house, as if it would last until whatever day Helen did get home. The next, she was fussing with her hair, trying to remember how she'd had it when Helen left. What if she doesn't recognize me? Lillian's friend, Penny, had even stopped in to ask Maggie if she thought her daughter was all right. Maggie looked over the last several pages of her journal. It seemed so repetitious, her cries of anxiety, worry, longing. She knew if she sat down right now, she would pen many of the same words. Oh, Lord, help me, she said. 
I'm letting myself be consumed by these anxieties, and I don't know how to stop it. She flipped through her Bible, looking for something about peace. She had an old concordance in the other room, but when she had looked up the word peace, she found hundreds of references. The one she was looking for eluded her. Finally, she pulled out the little Through the Bible in a Year pamphlet that her minister in Toronto had once given her. She'd been trying to follow it, though with mixed success. Today's reading was Philippians 4. She turned there with a sigh, expecting to find some wonderful but hollow feeling exhortation to joy. Wasn't that what it was all about? She wrote a few verses, then went back and read them again. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. <laughs> there it was, right there, praise God, she thought, and she reached for her journal. Lord God. I want today to let my request be made known to you to both beseech you for help and to give you thanks. I ask that you give me the peace you promise as I trust you with these things. Allow my mind to be filled with things that are true and honest, pure and lovely, virtuous and praiseworthy. Let me dwell on these things and leave behind my worries and fears. For Helen, Lord, I ask that she be on that ship, and I ask you to keep her safe and guard her health as she travels. I thank you, Lord, for her strong will and the strong constitution you've given her and for her trust in you. For Lewis, Lord, I ask for safety and that there in a far country he would see you at work. I ask that he would cry out to you and trust you in all the dangers and hardships he might be and be his rock, his fortress against the enemy. I thank you, Lord, that you brought him safe thus far, and I thank you that he is yours. For Lillian, Lord Jesus, I pray that you'd allow her to see past her hopelessness, past her anxiety, past her anger with her father, to the truth and beauty of your word. I ask that you would give her faith to be strong and grace to be faithful. And I thank you that you have brought a strong friend into her life. Thank you for Penny. Finally, Lord, I pray for Robert. Lord, you know how deeply buried is his fear and his love. I pray that you'd allow him to trust you with those things, to be able to give you his fears and show the deep love within him. Thank you that he is faithful, hardworking, and that he's angry violent. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, as I follow you today, show me the beauty of my children who are here. Remind me of the beauty of those who are away. Let me see your world as the work of your hand, as of our cause in this cruel war. Above all, peace. And fill me that passes understanding. Above all, God of peace, be with us and fill us with the peace that passes understanding. Amen. Mm -hmm.